I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both critical to our success. Um, we're also, uh, yep, so that's, um, let's see, we are on the wrong slide here. So I'm just going to go ahead and move this. So uh, just forget that you've seen any of that. Um, and I am going to go ahead and hand things over before we start uh, with um, our presenter, Thomas Padilla from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I want to introduce my colleague, Chayla Scott Weber, who will be kicking us off today. So Chayla, you're all set. Why don't you take it away? And I'm going to unmute you. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Marilee. Um, and good morning from the West Coast. Uh, uh, thanks so much for being here. So, um, so uh, this morning we are, uh, you'll hear briefly from me and then from Thomas Padilla. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, collections of data. And um, I'm going to briefly give you a little bit of context about why we're um, talking about collections as data this morning. So OCLC uh, research has a long history of working in the area of archives and special, special instinctive collections, and, and we work there because we recognize the value for teaching and learning and scholarship of special collections and also the, the um, that that's made possible by libraries' commitments to the stewardship of their distinctive collections, and that with the unique nature of that material, it can really make scaling um, work it can make scaling a challenge, and so we work in this area to kind of identify common need and and patterns to help um, libraries in our partnership work and learn together. Um, in October of last year, we released the Research and Learning Agenda for Archive Special and Distinctive Collections. You'll see a short URL there on the bottom of the slide for it. and. Um, and it was created via a participatory process involving colleagues from across the partnership and um, and outside the partnership. And it really discerns and articulates um, kind of shared challenges and opportunities uh, facing our sphere right now. And it's um, and it's guiding OCLC re research work in this area. Um, and so this morning, as part of that, uh, and, uh, and all through this year, we'll be presenting a number of webinars that respond to issues that surfaced in our work on the agenda. Um, and collections as data um, was one of the issues that surfaced in the agenda as an emerging area of interest, and really something that folks felt like they had a need for more understanding about. Um, it, and we said that, that collections as data and the kind of desire for computational access was really pushing the boundaries of what we think of as access to our, of our, to our collections and, and also pushing the boundaries of what an object of research might be. Um, and, and though I come from a special collections perspective, I also fully acknowledge that this is not <laughs> exclusively a special collections issue and that there's really broad interest. Um, and indeed, the agenda also acknowledges that supporting computational access and kind of datifying our collection, our existing collections will require the skills and input and collaboration across library departments and disciplines. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I was heartened to see the registration list for the webinar today. We've got a really broad range of roles and institutions joining in. And I think this full complement of Collaborators is is the kind of um, the kind of group that will be necessary to push this work forward, um, and we'll need those uh, all those collaborators because it there's all kinds of work to be done. Um, collaboration, conversation, investigation, planning, and of course funding, um, and that's why I was so pleased that Thomas Padilla agreed to join us here today. Um, some of you may be aware that Thomas is currently working with us here at OCLC Research as a researcher practitioner in residence over the next six months, but he also continues to be working as a visiting digital research services librarian at UNLV, where he is the principal investigator for a Andrew, Del Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded project called Collections as Data, Parts to Whole, 
which is the second in a series of grant-funded projects exploring computational access to library and archives collections. I'm excited for Thomas to share his work and learning from these projects um, today. So with that, I will turn it over to Thomas. Um, Marilee, I can't see the controls. Can you Some, yeah. turn it over so, <laughs> to Thomas? Yeah, there, Thomas, okay. Thomas, Thomas has control. So Thomas, you just need to share your um, share your slides with us. That is perfect. So just present. Yay. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Excellent. Okay. Um, so thanks for the for the warm introduction. Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to uh, talk about collections as data with RLP. When this opportunity came by, uh, talked with the uh, project team for the Mellon project, and uh, you know we really saw this as an opportunity that we couldn't pass up. Um, so happy to talk about collections as data. Um, <clears throat> Over the course of this presentation, I'm going to kind of share uh, a little bit of an origin story, kind of uh, you know, glints of how I got involved in this space. Uh, I'm going to work to try and provide uh, my perspective on on the concept of collections as data, like what the heck is this thing? Um, I keep hearing about it. Uh, what is it? Uh, well, today you're going to get, <laughs> to a certain extent, um, my perspective on um, you know what what collections as data means, um, and then I'll proceed to talk about two different uh, externally funded projects. Uh, one of them is the uh, IMLS funded Always Ready Computational Collections as Data that ran from 2016 to 2018 and included a number of amazing collaborators at institutions from across the country uh, operating in different contexts uh, in research libraries and archives. And I'll also be talking about um, a new project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation called Collections as Data Part to Whole. Uh, each of those projects tackles sort of a, a, different, a different challenge in this space. Uh, but that discussion will come towards sort of the, the latter half of this presentation. Uh, so again, roughly the things I'm going to cover, uh, sort of the, the concept of Collections as Data, some of the initial motivations to, to work in this space, and then I'll transition to talking about the IMLS project, which is largely about trying to explore the question of implementation. Uh, what it means to implement collections as data, uh, and then I'll transition to talking about the Mellon project, which is more about um, you know continuing to consider the question of implementation, but then also considering where the other foot drops, right? Um, like assuming that more institutions end up uh, developing collections in this vein, uh, it also stands to reason that um, uh, we need models for supporting the use of those collections. We need roles and services that kind of uh, holistically work across an organization um, to address the use of those collections. So concept of collections as data. Uh, just you know, from my, from my own perspective, uh, I was kind of tangling in the space in, in 2014. Um, I and a colleague uh, named Devin Higgins, uh, we were both at Michigan State University at the time, uh, wrote a paper called Library Collections as Humanities Data, the Facet Effect. Uh, you could see that I've struck uh, library and humanities here because the scope became broader as time went by. Um, but the claim kind of carries through. So uh, what we said was that you know libraries can further enhance use of their digital collections by considering how thinking of them as data and promoting them as such can encourage uses beyond reading, viewing, and listening. And that efforts of this kind are grounded in understanding that data afford new opportunities for user interaction with library collections. So that was in 2014. Doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it was. Uh, in 2016, the Library of Congress initiated their Collections as Data uh, event. Um, and I think it coincided with the launch of uh, Library of Congress Labs. They've been doing amazing work. Um, and I recommend following up on, on their activities. They've been doing a lot to sort of enrich and uh, catalyze conversation and activity in the space across the country. So as a, as a definitional question, uh, collections as data, it's basically uh, ordered information stored digitally. And you know, given those two sort of like prior factors, uh, the collections are inherently amenable to computation, say by digital humanists, data-driven journalists, uh, political scientists that are interested in data mining and text mining, and so forth. Given that definition, all different kinds 
of collections uh, are within the scope of collections as data. Everything from video to audio to uh, digitized books to email uh, to software, all within scope of collections as data. It's sort of helpful uh, when considering the possible uses of collections as data to think through the concept of affordance. This comes from uh, sort of the, the uh, design world. And it's you know, generally the notion that uh, physical objects have certain affordances, right? Um, when you walk into a room, <clears throat> you may or may not know that buttons that are uh, to the left of you uh, turn on the lights. Um, but even though you don't know what they do, they, they generally suggest they are something that you should push, right? So when we're thinking about collections as data, we're trying to sort of map what we know for working with physical objects like books. Uh, we know that they appear to uh, almost uh, unconsciously suggest to us that we should hold them in our hand, that we should flip pages, that there's some sort of forward progression. Uh, we want to be thinking about affordances that are particular to digital representations of uh, physical things, um, or just affordances that are, are native to digital things, like email that don't necessarily have a physical corollary. Um, there are sort of examples of uh, tools that can help you think through these affordances for collections as data. Uh, this is adapted from Janet Murray's affordance grid, where you know, basically she's trying to map out you know, for any digital object or, or data that there are sort of four essential affordances that you might think of that differentiate them from a physical thing. Right? So she has this procedural affordance, a participatory affordance, an encyclopedic affordance, and a spatial affordance. These are things that are particular to things being instantiated as data. And I think that this, this kind of thinking really kind of provides us different pathways or ramps for thinking about what that additional potential could be residing within our collections if we also consider them to be data in addition to the representation um, or a surrogate of a physical thing. In essence, it's, it's really about just trying to expose additional facets uh, of use for our collections that could um, help our various users as they're, you know, as they're conducting research or as they're engaging um, in new forms of pedagogy. So collections as data, ordered information, stored digitally, because of those two things, inherently amenable to computation. So some initial motivations for you know, getting involved in this space be like a little bit of story time. Uh, so in 2014, I was a digital humanities librarian, and a lot of my engagement uh, generally resolved to uh, teaching introductory text mining, visualization, mapping in an undergraduate classroom. And uh, that task was often sort of contingent on finding uh, collections or data sets that were readily amenable to me using them and helping students use them in a classroom. It was really difficult to find things that were in shape for that kind of use. And eventually, I had what seemed like a eureka moment to me, um, but I, I came to learn was also <laughs> a eureka moment for other people, as most things are when you think you're the only one doing them, um, is that we had a lot of data or collections that, that could be useful. Um, for digital humanities pedagogy, for example, it's just that they weren't necessarily uh, prepared, described, and provisioned in a way that anticipated that kind of use. And as an example, we had this project at Michigan State called Feeding America. Uh, I believe it was in it was either an NEH or IMLS funded project in the early 2000s to digitize um, cookbooks. And uh, you could see that sort of the anticipated audience for this at the time was you know, someone who wanted to uh, look at page images, download PDFs, or read transcripts of books. Um, great for that purpose. Um, not as immediately clear how this would serve the use of a digital humanist. It turned out to be the case that the path was pretty straightforward. It just involved sort of repackaging the collection, um, creating new documentation for it that was sort of akin to a README, if you're familiar with that concept. Um, essentially, it's, it's a self-documenting uh, uh, document 
that describes uh, various sort of important features that a researcher would be looking for if they wanted to evaluate the viability of a data set for a particular purpose. Um, so that was sort of the initial foray it was around 2014, and then casting a wider net started to find colleagues at um, a range of different institutions. UNC Chapel Hill, for example, um, was doing, you know, Stuart Barnard was doing great work with Doc South. Um, uh, University of Pennsylvania libraries were doing excellent work with OPEN, and uh, Indiana was doing some excellent work um, releasing, uh, I believe, collection metadata of the Cushman collection on GitHub. So that was some sort of early work. The things I was experiencing in the context of that work were, were verified um, by Miriam Posner, pretty well-known digital humanist, now in the iSchool at UCLA where she had said that libraries and archives and museums are increasingly making their materials available online, but as a general rule, these materials aren't of much use for computational purposes. Which raises the question, why are they not much use? Um, you know, using our stuff for folks that want to do things computationally with them are you know, kind of wrapped up in this GIF. Because our systems aren't really designed to support that kind of use, because the way that we've described the collections and because of the way that we've approached the creation of derivatives don't anticipate their use, it's, they interact with our collections like this, like they're trying to put a square through a circle and then ultimately they just pull the lid off of our collections and scrape them and you know have to go through a lot of workarounds that they don't necessarily need to. Um, just as an example, not to pick on the University of Wisconsin, I love the University of Wisconsin, I used to work in the Big Ten and I, I think it's the most beautiful Big Ten campus. Go, I think it's Badgers, sorry if I got that wrong. Um, you know, beautiful sort of, uh, you know, front end to their foreign relations of the United States uh, files. You click through a little bit further, um, you see that you can go in and, and, you can, and you can download a PDF. There are many hundreds of documents here sort of uh, documenting the history of the, of the foreign relations files, uh, but the path to working with these collections, say if you had a text mining project or if you wanted to just analyze uh, these documents at scale is pretty rough. Right, you, so I, I sort of like ran an experiment myself and what would I need to do? Well, I, I would need to write a Python script and I'm actually not very good at that. So it took a very long time. Um, and I had to basically figure out this weird workaround where I needed to scrape collections in order to get access to the data. Um, and you know, furthermore, because I wanted to do a text analysis project, or I was trying to figure out what it would take for a historian to do a text analysis project with this collection, I then had to convert all of these PDF derivatives um, into plain text files, which required running optical character recognition, you know, just this whole sort of matroshka of uh, technical requirements um, that didn't necessarily need to be encountered. So it's both sort of a, a, a challenge here of um, uh, access uh, and then also form, like the form that collections generally tend to take because they don't anticipate this kind of use. Uh, there's also the question of uh, collection integrity or description. Toby Burroughs here has a, a really nice sort of description where he says that, you know, there's a gulf between the way that um, academic researchers process collections or data and the way that uh, libraries, archives, and museums think about uh, processing, describing, and making collections accessible. You can kind of see this gulf when you look at something like uh, this data set from Ted Underwood, sort of a, a noted digital humanist, or digital humanist at the University of Illinois, where you know this is uh, data that was generated post-analysis of uh, books that are in the Hathi Trust. And you look at how he describes his data, right? So he's talking about genre predictions, and basically these series of uh, processing steps that he took. Uh, and then he subsequently talks about the kind of data that's generated, um, how it's organized, and then he alludes to various sort of quality factors. Uh, where I think this sort of loops back to our curatorial processes is that, you know, so for someone like Ted, when he's, you know, generating data from Hadi Trust, and then he puts it into something like GitHub, you know, what are the as aspects of description that he's calling out that support the viability of this data set for another researcher? Essentially, the things that he needs to include in order to support its reuse. And then I think it's useful to sort of loop back to, you know, if we want to prepare, describe, and provide access to collections, 
that are usable, how might our descriptive practices need to evolve um, or be modified in order to accommodate some of the levels of description that TED is needed to call out here to encourage the reuse of data associated with Hadi Trust. Marian Posner, Victoria Stodden, and Rupika Rassam all provide you know, various takes on this particular question. Uh, you know, with Miriam here, you know, to what extent, when we're looking at a collection, is information about provenance, uh, the manner in which that collection was processed before it was made available, and the method of presentation. It, are those things available to the user? With Victoria Stodden, to what extent are the data or the collection, and also the code that generates the collection available to the user? And then finally, Rupika Rassam, to what extent are the motivations driving all of the above available to the user? What is the sociocultural context in which that sort of allows for a particular collection to be made available? Is it the whole collection? Is it representative? Are there only particular parts? These can be really difficult things for an end user to get access to. And it's particularly important when they're trying to make collections or trying to make claims at scale across many decades or even centuries. There's also the issue of kind of, you know, collections as data is important because it sort of cultivates a, a perception that engages with sort of the imperative of the present, right? There's a lot of collections that we have that are just data already, right? There's no real conceptual jump between, okay, this is a digitized book, and then if I think about it as data, it allows for all these things. We, we have a number of things in our collections that are just data already, right? We have the challenges of email archives, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of emails coming into archives and collections throughout the country. How do we describe and provision meaningful access to collections that fully resist the feasibility of item level description? And then there's sort of the, the social imperative around collections like those that DocNow collects. Right? So we have all these social media data sets um, and they really, you know, as they come into archival collections, they really trouble uh, the boundaries of you know how we think about describing and providing access and then supporting the use of collections. They really strain the models that we have in place. And so collections as data is sort of an orientation that tries to motivate additional ways of thinking uh, in this particular space in order to meet like a real present challenge. So the Transition to uh, implementation. This is the, the IMLS project. <clears throat> so it's called Always Already Computational Collections as Data. It ran from 2016 to 2018. Uh, it's a joint effort between myself, uh, Lori Allen, Stuart Varner, Hannah Frost, Sarah Potvin, and Elizabeth Russi Roke. Uh, it is the product of contributions from people at organizations uh, throughout the United States and around the world. We're super thankful for their contributions uh, to project deliverables. This project could not have been possible uh, without their generosity. That project um, has a number of goals, but or had a number of goals, I should say, because the project is now complete. Um, but you know, one of the core sort of claims in that project was that you know that most of the ways that we approach digital collection development focus on replicating traditional ways of interacting with physical objects in a digital space. So this is the, you know, the, the idea that we digitize books, we provide page turning and zooming and, and downloading of, of whole documents because we want to support the reading of a book, right? But that the contention here is that this approach does not necessarily meet the needs of the researcher, the student, the journalist, and others who would like to work with computational and methods and tools to treat collections as data. The too long didn't read version of that is essentially how do we make collections more useful to more people? What gaps does this question surface? What opportunities does this question help us see for me, for you, and for the people that we aspire to collaborate, partner with, and serve? The project created a series of resources that document 
extant experience in this space that aim to share lessons learned and that suggest a range of paths into doing collections as data work. On that last piece, we really wanted to focus on a range of paths into the work. Um, you know, I think that any time we talk about computation or data mining or text mining or uh, data science, uh, it, it runs the risk of being perceived as the province of just a privileged few. And we really wanted to work against that. And in the course of project activity, try and represent paths into doing the work that assumed um, uh, different realities in terms of, of staffing, resources, and collections. So activities, deliverables, and impacts. I'll talk about activities first. By the numbers, so it was two years. We did two national forums. We had 17 face-to-face -face and virtual conference engagements. We had one full-day international pre-conference. We conducted two webinars, two conference workshops, one week-long DH Institute focused on collections as data with a colleague at the British Library, Tamiya Ridge. 382 people joined a collections as data Google group, and 59 people joined a collections as data Zotero group. There are seven primary deliverables. When we set out, I believe there were only three that we projected to create, but we're a very enthusiastic bunch. Seven primary deliverables, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of these in a little more detail, but at, at a high level, there's the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data. There are the facets, which are essentially collections as data use cases um, generated by uh, uh, real world examples of this work in practice. Uh, there are personas, there are position statements, there are characterizations of methods, basically things that researchers um, would like to do when working with collections. And then there are the 50 things. And finally, there is a white paper that we are feverishly working on as a team to release, hoping to release that soon. So the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data, it was uh, initiated or sparked at the first national forum at UC Santa Barbara in March of 2017. And essentially what it is is a, a collection of high-level principles that aim to guide activity uh, in the space of collections as data development. So things like collections as data stewards are guided, guided by ongoing ethical commitments, uh, that collections as data is designed for everyone, serve no one. Um, they're high-level principles. The, the goal with this particular document is not necessarily to provide answers, partially because um, uh, uh, me personally, I don't really believe that <laughs> there's a one ring to rule them all in this space. And, and what is more appropriate is to provide sort of high level principles um, that could structure guided conversation in a local context. So then in a local context, uh, you can resolve what ethical commitments mean um, relative to the communities that you serve and, and the collections that you hold. There are the collections as data facets. As I was saying, they are like use cases. Um, we also use the nomenclature of implementation. So an implementation consists of the people, the services, the practices, the technologies, and infrastructure that aim to encourage computational use of cultural heritage collections. Any given facet um, is kind of like a template. And so for each person completing a facet, they've answered the following questions. You know, like why, why be involved in collections as data? How did you make the administrative case uh, to do this work? Uh, how did you actually do it? Uh, do you have documentation that you can share? Please share it. Uh, how are you evaluating the use of collections as data? Uh, who are the people that support the use of collections as data? And finally, uh, what are some things that people should know about this work and, and what's next? And so we have a number of different examples. Um, I believe there are, I want to say 12 or 14 different examples. This is the first seven. And you can see it's kind of a range, so, you know, f everywhere from MIT to the Carnegie Museum of Art uh, to the American Philo Philosophical Society to the University of Miami. So you can see sort of a, a diversity of uh, what it took at a certain stage of development to engage in collections as data. 
We also have our personas, uh, where you know there are a number of these as well that address both end users um, as well as us, uh, libraries, archivists, museum professionals. Uh, we have personas to address our motivations and our specific goals as well. And uh, then finally, so I believe this was like three, three of the seven deliverables. The, the final one I'll discuss is called uh, the 50 things, the 50 things you can do. Um, the bulk of this was generated in our second national forum, but also drew upon a range of uh, engagements that we had over the course of the two years. Um, essentially what it is is just like a list of like 50 concrete things you can do to get started working in collections as data at your institution. So a super practically oriented, just like list of things you can do, okay? You got the concept, you see the value potentially, um, you think maybe there are users who might use this, here is now like a list of just like 50 discrete kind of things you could do to get started. Uh, as with most things, there's always the question of impact. What has our impact been? There have been many things that you might call impact, I suppose. Uh, collections as data was taken up as a strategic priority within uh, the University of California's content leadership group, specifically in their plans and priorities for 2017-2018. Uh, it was incorporated, as, as Shayla mentioned, into OCLC's Research and Learning Agenda for Archives. Uh, it informed the creation of postdoctoral positions, um, like the FTNA Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, focused on unlocking archival collections of data, and so on, and so on, and so on. In considering impact, we, as a project team for the IMLS project, also just thought it would be useful to ask people, has this thing been useful? <laughs> like, have you used it? Uh, and we and we got some good responses. I'll just share um, a couple of examples here. This first one here is from Ingrid Mason from Australia's Academic and Research Network, or I guess it's ARDET, uh, where she said, I'm leading data creation work uh, in a national research and data infrastructure project for the humanities, arts, and social sciences. The facets have informed the development of a data creation framework for data sharing and interoperability across multiple platforms, discovery, access, research, and archiving. I thought that was a great, that seems like a great impact to me. Uh, and the second one is from Charlotte Nunez at Lafayette College, where she said, I use it as a communication. I use collections as data, uh, perhaps the, I would guess the concept and also the collections themselves, as a communication and teaching tool about what digital archives are, why they're important, how they play a role in civic literacy, social justice, and community engagement aspects of our college's mission and what groundwork must be laid infrastructurally in order to support the building of collections as data, right? So a bunch of different dimensions of impact here to me. Um, a lot of capacity to spark interesting questions about sort of the social implications, um, the role that collections can play in civic literacy, um, and then also the nuts and bolts of like, what are the infrastructural requirements in order to do this stuff? So. This is a list of uh, some of the things. Uh, I'd encourage you to go to the website. Uh, please do check them out. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. And now I'm going to transition into the Mellon project. So uh, generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Collections as Data Part to Whole is going to run from 2019 to 2021. Uh, I'm working on this project with Hannah Skates Kettler at University of Iowa and Laurie Allen and Stuart Barner at the University of Pennsylvania. And what this project does is that it tries to sort of, uh, I, I mentioned like a shoe dropping and maybe I'm going to do mixed metaphors here. Um, but so, so basically the IMLS project really focused on the question of implementation. Um, you know, what does it take in order to implement and provide access to collections as data? Now, that begs the question of, you know, if you do implement and provide access to collections as data, are we organizationally prepared to support the use of those collections? Um, and by we, I mean libraries, archives, um, and museums to a certain extent. So to answer that question, collections as data part the whole aims to foster the development of broadly viable models that support implementation and use of collections as data. 
Collections as Data Parts a Whole will regrant $600,000 to 12 projects across two cohorts. I had mentioned broadly viable models and a, a plural for that, that, that we need a number of models. Um, and you know, I really want to place emphasis on that. You know, one of the things that we learned or that we had verified in the context of the IMLS project is that there really is no like one model to doing this work. There are many models. <laughs> and in order for the project to be successful, in order for there to be sort of forward momentum in this space, um, any activity must move forward, you know, with, um, you know, a fairly uh, sustained engagement with fostering a range of different solutions in this space. So our cohorts will create implementation models Right? So these are just clearly documented uh, paths into sort of like what it takes to prepare, describe, and provide access to a collection of this data. Um, each cohort will create organizational models. And so this, again, is a clearly documented roles and services, um, ideally holistically considered, that draw upon um, you know, resources across the library, not just the digital scholarship unit, um, but perhaps um, from the liaison group or perhaps from repository development. You know, we're really interested in seeing sort of organizational models that explore in holistic ways the development of roles and services that draw on multiple aspects of the organization. And then finally, cohorts will create new collections that speak to underrepresented histories. So the collections as data will be ones that speak to underrepresented histories. Cohort teams themselves will take part in a team lead institute near the beginning of their project. So we as a project team will be recruiting uh, disciplinary experts as well as um, senior library administrators to foster sort of a professional development activity. Um, to help project teams think through their projects. Uh, and, I sh and I should say as well that project teams themselves, the, the composition of them, and, and this was a, an intentional design decision, um, they are led by three people. So they're, they're led by every project team has a senior library administrator, um, a disciplinary scholar, as well as a team lead sort of driving project activities. So all those folks will come to a team lead institute. And then finally, there will be um, a public, public facing summative forum um, where they will share out their work with the community. Just a quick, you know, sort of uh, reference to the active projects. They, they began in January. Uh, there are, are six of them. Uh, the first one I'll just briefly mention here is called Collections as Data, Redefining Creators, Users, and Stewards in the Charles Teeny Harris Photographic Archival Collections from the Carnegie Museum of Art. Dominique Luster, Charlene Foggy Barnett, Ed Motznick, and Samantha Tickner. Super interesting project in a museum context um, where they're working through uh, sort of the capabilities and limitations of machine learning, text par parsing, and computer vision technologies applied to archival metadata. So they want to see, you know, what do all these emergent technologies, what can they do for us? How can they enrich access to our collections? And they have a super interesting component of their project um, where they are going to be doing a lot of community engagement that, that makes use of that data and even enriches the data that they produce. The second project I'll just quickly mention uh, is called Uncovering Health History, Transcribing and Publishing Early 20th Century Tuberculosis Patient Records as Data. It's at University of Denver, led by Kim Pham and a number of other folks. Uh, again, a, a really interesting project. They're all interesting projects, but I only have so much time. Um, this one's really neat. It's seeking to um, to add to the conversation about use in the context of uh, making, say, scans of articles um, keyword searchable or just searchable. Um, this is a, a technology that's for making handwriting um, searchable and you know, allows the creation of you know, plain text derivatives uh, that could support a whole wide range of different things. Um, so that's a really neat project. 
just sort of a timeline here, and I want to call out attention specifically to the Cohort 2 CFP. Um, so we will open the CFP for Cohort 2. That's where we'll distribute the other half of the $600,000 to six projects in August of 2019. Uh, if you have uh, any questions about that opportunity, I or any other member of the Mellon team would, would love to, to talk with you about any potential ideas that you might have. We're happy to, to look at drafts um, and, and iterate with you if you're, if you're considering an application. If you have questions about the CFP, uh, there will be some face-to-face -face engagements, probably more than these, but uh, myself, Hannah, and Lori will, will likely be at CNI, the spring CNI in 2019. Uh, myself and I believe Hannah will be at ACRL 2019. I'll be at the CSV conference. And if, it, if it's not a face-to-face -face engagement that happens, we can always do email, video chat, uh, or phone. Uh, those are our email addresses there. Uh, please do contact us if you have any questions um, you think that your institution or someone at your institution might be interested in applying for the Mellon opportunity. Uh, just another, just a quick, you know, closing couple of things that I would encourage you looking further into. Um, as I mentioned before, the Library of Congress was, you know, one of the key initiators of, of collections as data. They now have LC Labs. They continue to do an amazing diversity of work in this space. I, I encourage you to check out um, what they're working on. They have opportunities for engagement. Uh, the Princeton Center for Digital Humanities and the Princeton Libraries have been you know, thinking through collections of data over the course of the year and hosting hackathons on their campus. Uh, I, I'd recommend you know, checking out their activities. Also some, some, some useful ideas if you're thinking about getting collections of data kickstarted at your institution. And then there are two events. These aren't associated with uh, the IMLS project or the Mellon project. They popped up on their own. Super cool. Uh, there's going to be a getting started with collections as data um, panel at Arliss in, in March. If you're headed to Arliss, something to check out. And also at Museums in the Web in Boston in April, there's going to be cultural collections as data aiming for digital data literacy and tool development. Um, so check that out if you can. And that's, a bit, that's about all I have today. That was a lot of slides and a lot of stuff in a short time, um, I, and I'm, I would be overjoyed to engage with any questions that there are. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was uh, really rich and um, a lot of information. I'm going to give people uh, some time to uh, type in their questions um, into chat. I don't see anything yet. I hope I haven't missed anything. Uh, as you're typing things in, be sure that that chat box is set to all participants and then uh, go ahead and hit send, um, eagerly standing by for questions. Uh, let's see, we have um, Nathan Kelber. I'm sorry, Nathan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, has entered in um, some information on the, I need to make my chat box bigger so I can see all of this, on uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, cohort projects on the books, uh, Jim Crow and Algorithms of um, Resistance. So thank you so much for, um, uh, for, for uh, letting us know about that. Um, it's exciting to have, um, I noticed a number of people who are, um, have participated in this project in one way or another, or, uh, or at least from institutions that have participated in this project in one way or another, or on, on the call today. So that's super great. Um, so uh, one question that I have for you, Thomas, is um, what is the role, so looking at collections as data, what is the role that the metadata for those collections plays in um, in the projects, if, if any, or is the uh, focus really on the, uh, the collection, the, the data resident in the collections themselves? That's a, it's a great question. Um, the, the, so I, I'd say there's like kind of like two, two components to that. The, the metadata are sometimes the, the primary object that a researcher is using. Um, so, of course, it's a collections as data, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, the other component is 
uh, you know, for a, a lot of researchers, and, I, and I've seen Ted Underwood, who I mentioned earlier, talk about this in um, a lot of detail. Um, you know, the ability to, you know, make any claims uh, at scale in the in the analysis of say the objects is contingent upon um, the comprehensiveness of the metadata. So I guess there's three things that that metadata is within the scope of collections as data. Uh, that two, it, it's sometimes the, the primary object that researchers are studying. Uh, and three, it's, uh, you know, often the case or pretty much always the case that it's an integral component of being able to make claims um, at pretty much any point. Um, I guess there's a fourth component there too. Sorry if I'm going off the rails here a little bit, but you can, you can kind of see it in um, the Carnegie Museum of Art example where uh, you know, it's it's not only the case that collections as data is a is a conversation about, you know, how do we support researchers in the use of collections. It's also a conversation about how do we how do we think about collections differently, and how might we use some of the methods that our researchers are using in order to increase more broad spread access to our collections. And you can see that in the Carnegie Museum of Art example in particular, because you know, they're leveraging things like machine learning and computer vision and text parsing on archival metadata in order to enrich that metadata, in order to <laughs> increase the granularity of access uh, for an audience that isn't necessarily a digital humanist or a data-driven journalist, and, and, and I think that's perfectly fine. Super. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. I'm looking for questions. Chayla has a question. Chayla, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. So, um, Thomas, I was struck uh, in your presentation and, and have thought about this a bit in the past, too. Um, your slide from Miriam um, Posner and, and then a few others about sort of um, information about provenance and uh, processing and um, being necessary for this kind of uh, for this kind of access and use of collections and um, you know I think that that's something that we in archives think a lot about as sort of documenting provenance and documenting interactions but don't actually always do that well in practice. Um, and something that we think about a little bit differently than say like research data management when you're talking about the information that you need to um, to include with the data set for reproducibility. Um, and so in thinking about that, I sort of thinking about like practice that we might need to institute kind of across all of our collections as opposed to with us or across all of our practices as opposed to like we're getting this one collection ready for computational access um, like changes to descriptive practice that we might need to make in order to to sort of foundationally support this across our collections um, so I'm curious if you can say more about what kind of like provenance and processing information might be important for um, computational access. Does that yeah, make sense? That, yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. That's a great question. Um, and I would say I'm going to try and limit myself to three things. So, uh, you know, the first one was, um, you know, like one of the things I I think that that could help, sort of like across collections. Uh, like like a really practical thing uh, is to include um, some sort of indicator of estimated um, uh, OCR accuracy, right? So we we like if we're if we're providing plain text derivatives of text-based collections to include along with the documentation, you know, we believe that this um, OCR that we generated uh, is of you know X percentage fidelity to the original. Um, I think that would be super helpful, and, I, and I've seen a number of researchers ask for that. Um, uh, I suspect that providing that information might make some some institutions nervous, <laughs> you know, partially because they, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a little dirty secret that uh, <laughs> for a number of our projects, the, the output of the OCR is like pretty bad. 
um, and may require some um, a fair degree of uh, changing of practices in terms of how we tune the way we approach OCRing our collections, as opposed to just sort of running them through, um, you know, Abbey or Tesseract without necessarily training them. Um, the other thing ab about provenance is, you know, trying to um, attest to representativeness. Um, so, you know, a, a good example, I think, is that, you know, at the, I know it's not, it's not an archival example, it's more of like a broader sort of like collections example, but at the British Library, um, they had a project where they had a researcher develop a, uh, a subsetter for their collections. And the challenge that he was trying to address was, um, you know, like when you're like a historian or something like that, and you go to the British Library and you do a search and say you get uh, 200,000 matches or something like that. And then you were then to proceed to try and download um, all of those matches. And let's just say that you were able to download all of those matches. There's nothing in the system that is necessarily helping you understand how those 200,000 digitized matches relate to the overall holdings of everything that the, that the British Library has in that space. And so he had to do like this weird workaround where he was trying to quantitatively create a subset out of the digitized objects that were representative relative to the overall holdings of the British Library. Um, so to that question of representativeness, I'm not sure how that scales across collections as, as a provenance question, but I know it's a challenge that, that researchers often, often run into. Um, there was a third thing, but I, but I, but I forgot it. I'm sorry. I hope that's useful. Thank you, Thomas. Um, we have a question from Karen Smith Yoshimura, yeah. who uh, wants to know if any of the cohort projects deal with non-Latin script text. Um, Nathan helpfully provided um, a link to the cohort list, and just uh, scanning it, I didn't see any um, off that that struck me as being non-Latin script text, but maybe you could uh, talk about um, any emergent projects that you might know of. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so to the, to the question, not in this cohort, we would we would definitely love to see submissions uh, in that vein. Um, that is that is an, an underdeveloped space. Um, so so we we would love to see more. Um, people propose things that would make collections like that um, uh, available. Super. So Karen, you're getting some um, uh, some non-Latin text love there. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, um, uh, encourage some of your your colleagues uh, in in those communities to to consider this as an opportunity. Uh, what on that on that note? What about um, collections that aren't text based at all? Um, or does that kind of uh, stretch the boundaries of, of this type of um, the way that the project is uh, conceptualized? Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're, if I remember correctly, they're all primarily text-based. I, I think the um, you know the one that is technically not wholly text-based is the Denver example because they're you know they're using they're working with images of text. And so they're using sort of, you know, image analysis techniques in order to generate text. Mm -hmm. um, but but we would we would love to see a greater diversity of um, of uh, projects that that engage different content types. You know, as I said in the beginning, you know, any you know folks had uh, projects that were focused on artwork or audio or video um, or geospatial data. Um, or maps that could become geospatial data, uh, we, we would love to see those proposals. Super. Um, I am not seeing any more questions at the moment. Um, I'll just say a few things, and maybe that will uh, uh, give people some time to finish up typing uh, whatever's on their minds. Um, this presentation has been recorded. Uh, there were a number of links that were embedded in the presentation, and we'll make sure that you get those uh, as well as uh, a link to the to the slide deck itself um, so that you can 
uh, uh, refer to that. We typically have um, the recordings posted to our website within a week, sometimes a little sooner, um, and you will receive an email from me uh, with links to all of that. Um, so unless I see another question soon, I'm going to go ahead and thank everybody for their uh, attention today. Thank, super thank Thomas um, uh, for his presentation. Um, oh, here's a question from Helen Vincent, uh, a comment and a question. Uh, I love the ethical aspect of the Santa Barbara principles, but the best takes a lot of resources. Do you provide any guidance about the basic acceptable levels for those who can't do it all and need to prioritize? Thank you, Helen. And you are muted, Thomas. I'm going to take you off mute. There you go. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. Yes. Huh. It's an interesting question. So with So you know, as I you know, as I mentioned with the the Santa Barbara principles and sort of the the ethical dimensions of that, um, we didn't necessarily feel that it, it was appropriate for us to um, provide answers to those particular principles. Um, you know, really, we, we saw more of the function of that document is to sort of call out the questions. Um, that each institution should consider um, as they're thinking about doing this work and then working to answer that question within your context. Um, in terms of sort of like other collections as data activities, um, again, in lieu of sort of generating best practices, um, what we tried to do was instead characterize a lot of different approaches to the work and have those approaches documented uniformly in the same way. So that as you're considering doing this work, you might sort of peruse through the list of different kinds of institutions and see how they answer the question, you know, what is the administrative use case? How do I support use? How do I evaluate use? Um, you know, is there documentation that I can look at to sort of guide my initial effort? Um, and then in addition to that, we, I mentioned the 50 things document. <clears throat> and that is also sort of, uh, it's not necessarily sequential in difficulty. Like, you know, like that uh, the thing you, thing you can do number one is the easiest and thing that you can do number 50 is the hardest. They're all kind of mixed. And, you know, part of the reason we did that is because um, we didn't necessarily want to suggest that there is like sort of one linear path from basic to advanced. Um, I do think what could be useful um, is if you know members of the library, archive, or museum community um, could share, you know, sort of the fifth, you know, maybe the ten things that they did in order. So it'd be like kind of creating um, little routes throughout those fifty things, um, so a number of people can see different ways to engage the space. But it's, it, that's a, that's a great question. We we. struggled a lot with the ability of creating best practices. There was a relation between even the the ability to create something useful if we called it best practices. And in the end, we chose rather to characterize multiple different practices. Thank you. Um, and I like that uh, we're, we're ending on a note of what um, others could contribute back to, uh, to this project. Um, so we're at time at this point, um, as I've mentioned, this webinar has been recorded. Um, we want to thank Thomas and all of you for being such a great, great and engaged audience. Um, it was wonderful to see so many of you, as Chayla mentioned, so many of you in so many different roles. Um, you'll be hearing from me uh, when I have all the materials together, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us.